From Saigon, this is the American Forces Vietnam Network. Let's have some fun. Good morning, Vietnam. Welcome to the Don Buster. Beneath this snowy metal golden thing, the unborn grass lies waiting for his coat to turn to green. The snowbird sings the song he always sings. Tonight, a personal report by the Daily Mirror's special correspondent, John Pilger. Vietnam, 1970, the front line. I haven't been to Vietnam for three years. The war, after all, is a bore, so why go back? What is there left to say? Surely we've seen it all on telly. But our boredom has not made the war go away, so I've come back for the final act. No blood, no atrocities. Just the rejection of the war by those sent here to fight it. Just the quiet mutiny of the greatest army in history. This is Snuffy, some eight miles from the Cambodian border in a wilderness of jungle and mud controlled by the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. Snuffy is a beleaguered fort defended by the 1st Air Cavalry Division. The scene there looks so familiar, like a faded snapshot of another war we wish to forget half a century ago with its trenches and mud and barbed wire and boredom and young men and their puppies. Snuffy is important because it's the end of the line for the grunts. They are the 18-year-old drafted kids, the national servicemen on whom the entire army depends. They are the ones to whom the buck has finally passed from the president and the pentagon and the career men who catch coals in their air-conditioned command posts. Out of 400,000 American soldiers in Vietnam, only 80,000 fight, and almost all of them are grunts. Grunts in 1970 are a very different kind of American foot soldier. They are mostly from a world unknown to their commanders. They are the graduates of an American rebellion that stemmed from the war they have been sent here to fight. And quietly but massively, they have brought that rebellion with them here to Vietnam. For the grunts are unraveling the very fabric of the military. They are growing their hair, wearing love beads, smoking pot, flourishing the V sign of peace. And some are refusing to fight. The young men you see in this film are not a selected griping minority. I've spoken to hundreds of young soldiers and the rebellion they feel so deeply is everywhere. Stop, uh, spread of communism. I don't want to see communism spread all over the world. But nothing I can do about it. Just stay and do my time, which I'm going to do. Get, get out of Vietnam, go back to the world. I couldn't see any purpose in the war back home. Mm. I, you know, it never explained to me why we're actually here. And I, you know, I really had nothing against these people. I want to kill them. And you go out in the woods and they'll shoot at you first. You'll see them, you know, they'll shoot you if they get the chance. You have to shoot at them first. It's really bad. I still don't know why I'm here. That's the guy's truth. Three months and I don't know why I'm shooting these people. Today is the day. The grunts are the wheels of the green machine, the name they give the military. The green machine is comic book America with flesh on it. Today is the day for you to let people... A wonderland of heroes and slogans. In the green machine, a grunt doesn't seek out the enemy. He goes hunting for gooks. The green machine plays games like Wandering Soul. Wandering Soul is a tape that has been put out by the Psychological Operations Battalion and Benoit. It's used by the operating divisions and separate brigades to broadcast a rally appeal to the Viet Cong. The tape itself is a rather weird one with the, the funeral dirge music in the background and a father talking to his children saying he's died on the battlefield and he's trying to encourage his comrades to rally and join the uh, just cause. The Vietnamese people worship the souls of their ancestors, but this wandering soul is very different. It was conceived in an echo chamber by the US Army and is broadcast from a helicopter over jungle where the gooks are supposed to be hiding. Oh, 
tôi vợ tôi vợ tôi vợ tôi tôi bà đang về với con đi tôi đã về với mình đây nhưng tôi còn có hôn mắng hình hài nữa tôi đã chết rồi má con bây ơi tất cả hắn thương tán thương biết chuyện nào We drop, I'd say, about 800,000 leaflets a day. We tell them what's happened to them in their battles. We killed three of your people yesterday, and they know it. We tell them also that you're going to be killed this, you know, into the future. You could be killed, and why? Why? We ask them to desert their unit and what will happen to them once they rally, how they'll be well treated. Well, actually, it's been pretty slow. So far this month, we've had five. Last month, we only had one. The object of dispersing our leaflets by helicopters they'll take a bunch by hand and throw them out most of the time occasionally uh, trying to get a direct result of a science mission they'll take a whole carton which you'll see and just drop it right out hoping to hit someone Let's have some fun. you've got pride and you're really proud of what you're doing and, and proud of seeing what you have done in the past And this division has lived on a proud heritage. MacArthur said it well. This division is first in almost everything. General George Custerdale was in the uh, cavalry. And uh, now instead of rattling sabers, we have rippling rotor blades. Lifers and grunts, the career men who command the rear, the kids who hold the front. A lifer is a person that wants to make a career out of the Army. That they sit back in air-conditioned rooms and say, OK, you, you, you guys go out there and fight the war. We'll tell you where to go and how to do it. But all they do is sit back there and draw their combat pay for not doing nothing. We just sit back there on their butts. A lifer is someone, that, to me, that stays in the Army 20 or 30 years. And... just out in the boonies, humping the big pack and all, uh, fighting, Viet, fighting the Viet Cong and the NVA. Who does the fighting, the grunts or the lifers? The grunts. There are some lifers out there with us, but uh, they don't see too much action on them. Very few. <laughs> lifers are always, always in the rear trying to run everything out in the field, and the grunts yeah. out there trying to do the best you can. Like, the lifers is a... Uh, say like they're back here and like they say go to this hill and this hill they don't look at the terrain and everything and how rough it is and everything and the grunt and the grunt's the one that has to go through all the all the hell grunt has to do the fighting yes out on patrol 28 days out in the boonies the green machine jargon for the bush where the indians are days of boredom seconds of terror a mile a day waiting to be shot at waiting to step on a mine Boring waiting. On this patrol we hear a chicken and the captain says it may be a Viet Cong chicken. No lifer in his helicopter can kill that chicken. Only the grunts can kill that chicken and its owner. On this patrol, the medic says to me, hey man, why doesn't TV show how boring this war is? I'm Army Sergeant Roger Clay Ashworth. Have a good day now. The difference between a lifer and a grunt is the lifer is supposed to know the why of it, and the grunt thinks there is no why of it. He's just over here, and it's, uh, we all count it in days. We can almost every one of us tell how many days we have left to do in Vietnam. When you're out on long-range patrol with this new kind of grunt, do you give orders or do you sort of enter into discussions? It's a combination of both. Uh, it's not near as many orders as I thought it would be. The, uh, there's a, an old saying in the United States Army that you, ha you, you don't tell American soldier, you tell him why. And I didn't believe it as much until I came to Vietnam. And I've had several times when uh, I thought my people were being insubordinate because they wanted to know why or my NCOs out there being insubordinate because they wanted to know why. And maybe because of the emotions at the time, you know. I had to say, 
you'll do it, damn it, you know, because I say you'll do it. If I had to do over again, I would go to jail. For one thing, in California, the max usually that you're going to get is three years. Okay, what's three years in the jail compared to two years in NAM or three years in the Army? I don't really think that uh, there is going to be another generation of American soldier. I think that people are just tired of it. There's, you know, there will be people in the Army, but uh, the people that really feel strong about it aren't going to go in. Already, Miss America, from Birmingham, Michigan, and Alabama. Out of the sky drops Miss America and her friends, just for the grunts. Flown in with the ice cream, packaged, homogenized, untouchable white flesh. Fodder for dreams of home. <laughs> are dying. At a level acceptable to both the American military and the American public. Another 65 this week, about the same next week, and the next, and the next, until the very last American division, combat division, is withdrawn. And so far, for all the words from Washington, only paper soldiers have gone home. The war isn't over, but it is ending. It is ending not because of the Paris talks or the demonstrations at home. It is ending because the largest and wealthiest and most powerful organization on earth, the American army, is being challenged from within, from the very cellars of its pyramid, from the most forgotten, the most brutalized, and certainly the bravest of its members. The war is ending because the grunt is taking no more bullshit. I just don't like, uh, I just can't take too much pressure from the army. You know. What happens to an unpopular officer out in the field? Mostly unpopular officers, from what I heard, if they, if they mess with a grunt too much, they get shot out there. A friend of mine, uh, Captain, uh, kind of got shot in the back. What, what was he doing? What was the Captain doing to deserve well, being shot what, in the back? Uh, from what my friend said, he was uh, telling them to just go on through. And, uh, well, they were, getting, they were getting hit pretty bad. And uh, he was telling them just to keep on going. <laughs> they said, no. He kind of got shot. Well, yeah, there's... 
lot of mistakes. But, you know, the grunts um, don't always do what the captain says, you know. We got, uh, see, the captain will stay back. He'll tell a platoon or something to go out so many hundred meters, you know. We don't do it. <laughs> we only go as far as we get out of sight, sit down, and come back in. We don't want to hit contact. That's one thing we don't want to hit. Vice President of the United States, Mr. Spiro T. Agnew, arrives in Vietnam. He visits the Presidential Palace in Saigon. Here he gives the President of South Vietnam a gift-wrapped filing cabinet, a token of his esteem. Are you in need of a friend? I need a friend. Someone who tells you things, important things. But I'd like to get to know you. Someone who offers you a wide degree of interest. Sports, good books, interesting stories, girls. Well, the Stars and Stripes could be considered a friend. After lunch, he will fly by helicopter to the heavily fortified American Embassy. There he will meet the American ambassador and American generals and pass out ballpoint pens and posthumous medals. Tomorrow he leaves Vietnam, having been assured that all is well. He will meet no grunt. A few months ago, when I was in the United States, this letter was given to me by a woman who lives in a small town in Ohio. The letter was written by her son, Kenneth, while he was serving in the infantry in Vietnam. I'd like to read it. Hello, Mom. Well, the shit has really started here. I've been in combat two months now, almost since the day I got here. I'm so confused about it, all I think some days is I'm going crazy. These people, the gooks, hate me, hate us all. So why am I almost dying for them? All the guys who are putting themselves on the line are grunts like me. We don't think this war is worth dying for. We don't think the lifers who won't fight are worth dying for. We've talked this out and we've decided to tell the company commander we're not working and walking into that bush again. At least we'll go to jail where it's safe. The afternoon Kenneth wrote that letter, he was killed. The telegram his parents received said he had died a brave man while storming a Viet Cong bunker. The medals they received said much the same thing. And the box they received in which their son lay was marked this way up, unviewable. How many Americans have been killed and wounded in Vietnam? Uh, through the uh, 22nd of August, 43,418 U.S. killed. How many U.S. troops are presently in Vietnam? Uh, how many U.S. troops are presently in Vietnam? Of these, how many are in ground combat? That is, they are likely to go out on a long-range patrol. Uh, I, we don't break them out that way. We say that uh, approximately 60% of our forces in country are in either combat or combat support units. Would a figure of 80,000 be near? A figure of what? 80,000. I don't really know off the top of my head. I'd have to take that question. Do you have a proportion of this for drafted men in Vietnam? No, we have no proportions on what kinds of uh, uh, breakout of uh, draftees or, or enlistees. Uh, there possibly may be at the Department of Defense. We don't have it here in the country. How many American casualties have been caused by mistake in the field? Do you have a figure for that? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. How many American casualties have been caused by mistake or accident, either in the field or on the base? Uh, you're, you're asking me for how many casualties by mistake or accident? Yes. Uh, would you, I don't have the statistics here, I don't believe, but would you rephrase the question because I don't quite understand. Well, it. for example, uh, when a man is killed by a friendly rocket, that is a mistake. How many people have been killed by mistake rather than have been killed by the enemy? I see. You're excluding, uh, you're, you're now excluding any accidents like uh, aircraft accidents or automobile accidents or this thing. No, I'm, no, including all those. All accidents, all mistakes. Uh, I don't have those statistics. There's available. no breakdown. 
I'll, uh, I'll find out for you. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what the desertion rate is for servicemen from Vietnam or on leave from Vietnam or on R&R &R for Vietnam? That's I, I don't have that, uh, that figure with me. What you have just seen is the daily press briefing for correspondents in Saigon. There are 444 of us here this week, although very few bother to come to what is called the five o'clock follies. The reason they don't come is that they don't learn very much here. For five years, the follies have gone on with much the same theatrical staying power as a West End farce. Every day, the same evasions, the same euphemisms, the same jargon. For ordnance, read bombs. For interdiction, read blasting away at nothing in particular. The other week, the firebase ripcord had to be evacuated. It was, perhaps, one of the major defeats of recent months. It was referred to here as a redeployment of troops. I've heard it said that the object of the follies is to lull the press into laziness and boredom. Just give them the old body count and they'll print it. And it's interesting that no major American newspaper ran the story of the massacre at Pinkville until competition forced it to. And one TV network is still using the same battle film over and over again. Perhaps this is why the war is such a bore. My name is Colleen and I'm from Wisconsin. Anybody here from Wisconsin? No, is all you people? As part of GAP, the Grunt Appeasement Program, at least that's what the grunts might call it, the donut dollies arrive at Snuffy. Donut dollies are girls of the American Red Cross sent to the front line to play games with the grunts. Good, clean novelty games like Monopoly, Quizzes and Blind Man's Bluff. Okay, what we're going to do is ask you to toss some questions on trees, okay? Here comes the first question. Who cut the wilderness trail to Kentucky? Danny Boone, this side. However, the novelty could be wearing off. The other day a donut dolly was blown up by a grenade and another was stabbed to death by grunts. This one nobody's ever gotten, so it's going to be 20 points. What is the name given to the byproducts of the forest, such as turpentine and resin? Sundries. What? It's pretty obvious that nobody knows your job like you do, the guy who's doing it. Maybe you know a way it can be done better with the savings of time, money, or manpower. Don't sit on your good idea. Spell it out in writing and submit it to your services suggestion program. I suppose some of you watching this film will say it's peddling the anti-American line yet again. Or perhaps another kind of person could make another kind of film. But I've lived in America and I've been in the mud of America's war in Vietnam. And I do know that thousands of young American soldiers, like the grunts of Snuffy, are fighting an enemy that isn't called Gook. It's called the US Army, and that takes guts. Out on patrol, one of my friends was the medic, and when I was leaving, he said to me, hey man, tell them back in the world we're coming home, and we're never coming back. I don't like violence. I try to stay out of much violent, out of much violent as I can, because violence is something not to, it's not, violence is not, nothing to play with. You gotta live your life the way you wanna live it. If you want to live it in violence, you live it in violence. If you want to live it in peace, you live it in peace. And that's how I live my life, peace. There's a woman traveling with two men. They opened fire and that's where you had to shoot back, you know. I think it's bad to have to kill women and children, but over here it's necessary. Definitely against violence, but, you know, it's just two years span. I can go back home, back to the old ways. Yeah, I'm thinking about my girls. I got a telegram two weeks ago and she died. It was a really bad thing. We were planning on getting married and everything. I really ruined a lot of my plans, you know, now I just want to go home and start all over. My wife's going to have a baby next month. Uh, I'm really looking forward to going home now. That wraps it up this evening on Million Dollar Music from the Big VN. Saluting.
war in Vietnam ended officially in January last year. American troops were seen to go home. Mr. Nixon said it was peace with honor at last. And those of us who had reported the war through its longest years also went home. For as a news story, the whole boring mess of Vietnam was finished. So much for the fantasy. Since the Paris Agreement and the so-called ceasefire, more than 70,000 soldiers and civilians have been killed in Vietnam. But this film is not about the day-to-day -day slaughter of soldiers. It's about the continuing and growing and forgotten suffering of the Vietnamese people in what is still, almost incredibly, America's war. On the streets, the Americans appear to have gone. They haven't. The Pentagon has thousands of men in Vietnam. They include senior officers, pilots and technicians, many of them disguised as civilians and embassy officials. American military headquarters is now called the Defense Attaché's office and functions almost exactly as it did before the Paris Peace Agreement. But the majority of Americans in Vietnam, without whom the war could not go on, are servicemen who have transferred directly to the payroll of some 60 American companies on contract to Washington. Some of them have been here eight and ten years, you know. Uh, their contract normally runs on when they're working for a contractor, uh, usually run a year, but uh, most of the people have been here a number of years, three years or older. People who have transferred from the army and then gone on to contract work. Uh, many of them, many of them in that category. What were you doing in the Air Force? I was working on an electronic countermeasure system. What, a, what is that in plain language? Uh, in plain language, that means uh, um, a device that will let you know uh, that radar is being look, is looking at you, yeah. and it will let you know that that is happening. A surveillance device. Basically, device. a surveillance yeah. device. Yeah. Yes, and that and that's the that the extension of that is the kind of work you do now. Yes. So what would happen if the the Vietnamese didn't have the surveillance assistance, didn't have the American assistance now? I'd say within a week to possibly a month, um, North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong would probably overrun this country very easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who are the American pilots that fly the planes first and train them? Are these military people? No, civilians. Civilians. <coughs> civilians from uh, these aircraft uh, companies, companies like uh, Lockheed and uh, well, the, uh, Northrop. 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 Yeah, they, yeah. Build, they build the F-5. The GE makes the engine for it. And um, they, they know the aircraft, so. They fly the aircraft until they can train the Vietnamese. Yeah. And they will uh, stay over here. I don't know how long, a six-month contract or whatever it may be. Big Will Plunkett, a nice guy from Atlanta, Georgia, has been the man from Monkey Mountain since he transferred from the Air Force to Kentron, Hawaii Limited, a defense contractor. Monkey Mountain overlooks the city of Da Nang and is a vital power plant, radar and surveillance base, equipped by the U.S. Air Force and run by Will Plunkett. If I just come and go, if I haven't stayed so long. Well, Will, as the man from Monkey Mountain, this is your very private domain up here overlooking Da Nang. What are the installations here? What kind of work do you do? Well, I'm, um... Right now, I'm an uh, advisor to the VNAV power plant. Uh -huh. and, uh, they have the radar up here for um, air traffic control and different things. And they also keep an eye up north, you know. Yeah, in North but Vietnam. There has been uh, quite a few penetrations down here of the North Vietnamese aircraft. But a power plant controlling what? Controlling military installations in Da Nang itself? Right. So you're a very vital man. Do you think without you it, uh, it could be run effectively? Um, yeah, I think without me the card game wouldn't be any good, you know. I wish there was more appreciation shown on the Vietnamese part. We stand uh, quite a flow. Of, this, this was the starting point for the Chinese takeover of all Southeast Asia, which hasn't stopped and won't stop for years. But had it not been stopped here, this part of the country or this part of the world and these people would have been as isolated as China is today and has been for over 20 years. And it wouldn't stop there. There would be Taiwan and Japan and then anything else that they felt that they could just sort of uh, like a plague go over the top and isolate to become their people and that's what would have happened. But we stood up to them, we stopped them, we put the fear of God in more or less to speak and uh, Hopefully this has stemmed the flow now. I think it was all worth it. Definitely. 
definitely. Every 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 limb that was lost and every individual sitting back in a veterans hospital now, and every death. It's I think it's all worth it. I surely do. Last month, President Nixon asked the Congress for two billion dollars in aid for Vietnam. Most of it will be military aid. Less than a half of one percent will help civilians maimed by the war. These people are lucky, for there are still only three hospitals for civilian amputees in Vietnam, and this one at Quang Nai, run by the Quakers, is the best. Nothing has changed here. They still make their own limbs and wheelchairs, and they still can't meet the demand. Most of our injuries, war-related injuries, are our mines. And second are grenades. Third are artillery and gunshot. But primarily, our biggest problem is kids stepping on mines, and that is the same problem that existed in 1972. And I think it's very interesting to note that that's covered in the peace accords and the peace agreement. Is, I think it's Article 7 or Article 15. I'm not really sure. Which says that 15 days at oh, there's where the 15 comes in. 15 days after the ceasefire. Um, all mines will begin being cleared. We have seen nothing um, that, that has happened in that area at all. This is, of course, over a year after the ceasefire now. This kid was injured last September, and um, his father sells gasoline. And when the two sides were fighting, some stray bullets came into his house, and the gasoline was set off, and this kid was very, very badly burned. He not only has burns on his face, but also on his legs and his feet. You can see that his feet are pretty badly contracted. He probably has trouble walking. It's a very severe problem for kids like this. There just isn't the kind of plastic surgery around to take care of them. How old is he? Seven years old. He looks very much in shock still, is he? He's a pretty sad kid. Her name is Tan Wien. And what happened to her? She was out taking care of cows, and she stepped on a mine. It's the same old story, isn't it? Yes. And she's lost her right leg below the knee. She may be an AK, let's look. Yeah, below the knee, that's right. So she, she probably stepped on one of those little foot bombs. Yeah. You know, as they em, call it. Em, em nhớ không là là Okay. The, the man behind us, she's not giving any answer, and the man behind us said, uh, the mine exploded. How is she supposed to know? She didn't see it. Of course, kids will go on stepping on grenades and mines for years to come, I imagine. Right, and uh, that's a, a new problem now. We see a lot of that happening now. Um, How old is Jin Tihai? She's 16. She was out cutting um, a rau, or vegetables. You know, it's, so there's a green vegetable that grows that people eat here a lot. She was out cutting that to gather for her family, and she stepped on a mine. These were the strictly anti-personnel, anti as they called them. Oh, yeah. Like Might that. flatten a front wheel on a bicycle, but the thing it's best at doing is taking off feet. Mm. Julie, how do civilian casualties now in the second year of the peace match up with casualties in the last year of the war? Well, year, in the year 1972, which was the last, quote-unquote, the last year of the war, uh, about 65% of our patients were war-related. That means directly war-related, a mine or a, a, a shot. 61% of our patients in 1973 were war-related. You're in the midst of the war here. Why do we still have a war now, in the second year of the so-called peace? I guess the biggest thing for me is that American aid continues here. And as long as the arms flow into Vietnam at the, at the, rate, they're, you know, at the rate they're flowing in, people are going to go on getting shot, mines are going to go on being laid, new mines are going to go on being laid, and people are going to go on being injured. As far as I'm concerned, there should be an end to, to all military input into this country. How many Americans are still here in South Vietnam, directly or indirectly involved in the war effort? Uh, the uh, last statistics that I saw released by the American uh, embassy, and I think that uh, is uh, uh, quite, uh, quite uh, accurate, is about uh, 6,500 uh, all counted. But Dr. Kissinger has said it's only 2,300. Client and master cannot agree. Unofficially and reliably, there are 15,000 Americans still in Vietnam. How many soldiers and civilians have been killed on both sides since the Paris Peace Agreement? Well, the, if you want the uh, total, I have to add a li little bit here. Uh, 52,000 plus uh, 14,600. That's uh, 66,600. And uh, plus another. 2,500 uh, civilians, uh, that's uh, 
sixty nine thousand. What happened to Yang? Three weeks ago now, uh, M. Yang uh, was on one of these defoliation operations in front of the troops. They hit a mine and blew up. Two were killed right on the spot. Seven were seri uh, seriously injured. Yang was one of, one of those. What you're saying is that they used as human mine detectors. <clears throat> they have to clear the minefields. That's really what it amounts to. Uh, it, uh, uh, this comes as something of a surprise to us, but now in finding out about her and inquiring around, we've found that there are a number in the hospital just like her who've also been forced to go out and around the perimeters of outposts, clear away brush in areas that are heavily mined. I asked her, why did you go and help out with the operation? She said, uh, well, if we didn't go, the soldiers would beat us. Uh, and so everybody has to go. Uh, Earl Martin is another kind of American who has lived and worked with the Vietnamese. He took me to a refugee village called Son Tra. Here, almost everybody is starving, regardless of the thousands of tons of food which leave the United States and Saigon, but seldom get here. Vietnam has always been the rice bowl of Asia, and hunger is one ordeal they've never known. Sorry about all the kids tripping us up. He's just saying that the reason so many kids are following us is because they think we're going to give out some food. Uh, he keeps yelling to them that, no, indeed, we're not going to give out any food, but they keep following me anyway. Has the food situation improved here at all since the ceasefire? Well, the people have been here for since 66, and they've always been eating very little. But by and large, the, situation is, the food situation has gotten even worse since the ceasefire. Uh, People are a lot hungrier now than they were a year ago. Yeah. What is that, Earl? What, what is he eating? It's the foliage of uh, sweet potato plants. Uh, uh, I asked him if the ludicrous question if it's good. And he said, uh, of course not, it's not good. Uh, but so, we're hungry, we have to eat it. So this is the village food supply at the moment, isn't it? This is what the people eat. The Saigon Army Outpost is not defending the villagers from an enemy. It's preventing them from going back to the abundance of their rice paddies just three miles away in so-called enemy territory, although the villagers might have another view of who is the enemy. Even their fish harvest is in danger. Fish in the bay have been poisoned by chemical pesticides dropped by American planes. And further out to sea, the fish can't be reached because there isn't enough petrol for the small boats. Graham Greene wrote his novel, The Quiet American, here at the dear old Palace Hotel in Saigon. Green described a type of almost lethally innocent American official whose aim was to sell the American way of life to the Vietnamese, whether they wanted to buy it or not. Under Presidents Eisenhower and Kennedy, the quiet American became real and multiplied, passing out millions of dollars and favors and portable flush lavatories and weapons and arranging the quiet extinction of those who opposed the regime they wished to set up. But somehow it all got out of hand and 53,000 Americans and 2 million Vietnamese were dead. Now the quiet Americans are back, doing almost exactly what they did 10 years ago, passing out millions of dollars and favors and arms to a client regime they wish to prop up. How ironic it is. It's all come full circle here. It's all back to where it was when it began. We definitely are vital at this stage. Uh, they're in a transition period trying to uh, make something of a growing country. And uh, we just will help them until we feel that they can handle the uh, situation themselves. And at, I'm sorry. And at that time, we intend on leaving. Yeah. My plans are to expo export, I believe. I'm, I, I want to export Vietnam products. And I think we can do it. Also, I would like to install in-country security systems, electronic types. Round and round the garden goes the teddy bear. One An American embassy official arrives at a Saigon orphanage to award the best child of the month prize. All the children here are bastards of the American war, for which the embassy will do nothing, except, of course, to provide that free ice cream for the lucky prize winner.
What about this little one down here? Uh, she's been here only about uh, three weeks now, I think. Yeah. Um, she was found abandoned uh, on the streets of Saigon, and some yeah. taxi driver picked her up and took her to one of the Vietnamese hospitals. Yeah. Uh, and she's totally abandoned. We don't know who the mother and who the father. So the father was an American, obviously. GI, yeah. and yes, obviously. Hmm. What's her name? Wow, H O A. That means she's a lotus, lotus flower. Oh. Victor, you've written a report on all these children. There's one on Kwong here, which I think I'd just like to read because I think it sums up a lot about the children who are left after this war. Yeah. It says, now about the mother, says she was a smack girl, that's a bar girl. Bar girl right. She met him, the father, in 1969, a GI. They fall in love each other. This is written by Vietnamese. They stay together illegally. She has a son. When she was pregnant, her husband left Vietnam. His friend pitied on her and helped her. Later, they stay together as husband and wife, and she delivered another child. Both of her two children are black. She did not know the name of the second husband. Now the mother earns money as a prostitute. She's in debt, but she said she dare not ask for more. The only one thing she hopes for is the health of her children. Her youngest child is two years old now, father unknown. How long do you think Vietnam will produce orphans? Can you see in a few years' time that you won't be having orphans here? Well, well <laughs> there again, it's a very difficult question, I suppose. Um, Hostility still continues, and uh, orphans are being made uh, every day. So as long as this kind of uh, situation continues, I think the need for uh, child care assistance is going to continue in this country, and uh, we are here only to go on helping as long as the help is needed. The Americans here are just the same as before, only the uniforms are different. And because the Paris Agreement says they shouldn't be here, an appropriate euphemism has been found for their work. The war that gave us ordnance instead of bombs, neutralizing instead of killing, has at last renamed the military, Management Services Division. These men are employed by the Lear Siegler Corporation and in effect run the Saigon Air Force. The Paris Peace Agreement was signed on January the 28th, 1973. Article 4 says, The United States will not continue its military involvement or intervene in any way in the internal affairs of South Vietnam. More than a year later, Americans are still here at the base at Da Nang, still playing their Saturday afternoon softball game. Perhaps someone forgot to tell them about the Paris Agreement. The guys of Management Services Division are all nice guys who never see the victims of the bombs and napalm dropped by planes which wouldn't fly if the Americans were not here. Get a hit now. Booty getting tired, booty getting tired. Go away, run on anything. Get a hit. Booty getting tired. Oh, There's a future for everybody here. There's no future here. The only future here is to make it while you can and get the hell out. Very few people are emotionally involved in the wars anymore. Yeah. You know. Well, you, you, uh, both you people advising uh, the Vietnamese Air Force, uh, now if you two left and people like you left, what chance would uh, they stand against? Uh, They'd fall on their ass. They could overrun this base, I'd say, in a week, wouldn't you? A good week. Uh, any they got any time here. they want, any place here, they'll take it. It's air to air. Every, what I talk to here is filled with gloom. They're either looking forward to leaving or they say that the, uh, the whole thing is going to collapse without the Americans. It's, it's not going to collapse. You take a look. All they'll do is change their government. You take a look right now in North Vietnam. 
Your little mama sign is still out there on the street selling her tomatoes. The country cannot work any other way. Your idea, or the American idea of communists, as applied to Asia, just doesn't, just doesn't apply. But you, you have preconceived concepts, and they're out there. They're going to their schools. They go to their schools the same way. They run their markets the same way. All the changes is the guy in power. But doesn't doesn't this contradict the whole reason for an American presence here for the last seven, eight years? Do you think after all those years and all those deaths that it was worth it? No, I don't. Why don't you? I've seen the war here when I was here in 66 and 67. I've seen it here as a civilian. And I don't think it was worth it, no. Yeah, but you but haven't... That, that's you, my opinion. But you haven't, opinion. you haven't lived with the Vietnamese. And I've lived with the Vietnamese. It's, it's my tax dollars going, no. too, though, see? Well. There's lots of problems all over. And there's too many Americans down on this country right here. Too many people, too many years, you know? It's, uh, there's lots of problems here. Could I, could I ask you, do you think it was worth it? Do you think that 52,000 deaths here was worth... 52,000 deaths. American were, deaths. Were 52,000 American deaths are less than we lose in traffic in one year. You don't but even did. miss it. But, but here you are in a it situation. It wasn't a great war, but it was yeah. the only war we had. Said it was on a morning when they were going out to cut grass and to harvest their rice like normal. And uh, at six o'clock in the morning, the, the cannons started blasting from the hill. And then the troops came in, rounded up the people in, in this area, right, right down along this stretch, uh, and shot them. Rồi người ta xuống vào vào kinh này. Dạ, họ bán xuống cây này. Rồi trên đây cũng có, dưới cây cũng có. There is bodies in the ditch, bodies along the banks. His father, his mother, a younger brother and a younger sister were all killed. My Lai was the worst massacre of the old war and is now a symbol of the new war. A few days after we filmed there, it was a battleground once again. And once again, the survivors were refugees and moved down the hill. When American officials those officials who are still in Vietnam and still doing so much to run the war for Saigon come to a place like this. How do they get the optimism that still tells them that there is a chance still for a successful American involvement in Vietnam? It seems to have gotten to the point where you've almost got to continue believing the story. You've almost got to continue believing the reasons for why you were here in the first place. Uh, uh, if after so much investment, and uh, so many American lives lost, we discover it was not really to help the Vietnamese people at all, but the total effect of it has been to devastate the landscape of Vietnam and to, and to have a scene uh, like we just visited uh, by the ditch at My Lai. Uh, if you have to come face to face with that reality, it's almost too much. Uh, so it's almost that you've got to continue believing the myth that it was good that we were here. There is a waiting list for burials at this military cemetery near Saigon. And these are the new graves of young Vietnamese soldiers killed in one week while we were there. 
There are 70,000 graves in this cemetery. That's exactly the number of dead in 16 months of peace with honor. that uh, we liberated South Vietnam, but uh, when it uh, arrived... Uh, <laughs> you couldn't believe it. <laughs> it is, uh, so, I was uh, so happy. And I go all day long, and it seemed that uh, I didn't go with my legs, but with my head. <laughs> Do you remember Vietnam? Do you remember all those television pictures of faraway suffering? Of reporters shouting over the noise of meaningless battles? Vietnam ran longer than Z cars, and at times had popularity ratings even higher than Kojak. This is Saigon, 1978, now called Ho Chi Minh City. I left Saigon with regret on April the 29th, 1975 on one of the last helicopters on the last day of the longest war this century. The war in this small Asian country occupied much of 10 years of my life, and now I'm back with many memories and emotions and trying to guess what has happened since. What is life like in Vietnam now? The film that follows is one impression. Considering that foreigners are almost extinct here now, the scope of my travels from Hanoi to Saigon has been generous. By my standards, it's been limited. Some nostalgia may creep into this film, but if it does, it will be nostalgia purely and simply for the endurance of the Vietnamese people whom I admire. And in case you've forgotten, let me remind you of what they endured for 30 years. Vietnam was napalm. Napalm was a chemical made especially to stick to human skin and to fry people slowly. In my first innocent days here, I saw napalm dropped. It exploded like huge puffs of blood. And when it had cleared, a child ran screaming and engulfed in flames. 
Vietnam was people shot and laid out like rabbits so that the photographers and TV teams could get the best angles. And of course, they are all Viet Cong, even the babies. Vietnam was atrocities you never knew about, of pictures never sent and never published because it was believed that you might be offended. Vietnam was riding on a helicopter with a heap of dead and dying young GIs, and one of them saying just before he died that his mother believed that Vietnam was somewhere near Panama. Vietnam was drug-addicted kids selling jasmine here in the streets of Saigon, and grey-suited men thousands of miles away mouthing relentless platitudes about peace with honour. Above all, Vietnam was a war of rampant technology against people. For me, it was always difficult to walk away from them, but even more difficult to look them in the eyes, and it still is. Peace on the Perfume River in the city of Hue, the old imperial capital for which the North Vietnamese and American Marines mauled each other and the civilian population in 1968. Like many outsiders, I used to see Vietnam as a war, seldom as a country. Even the sight of people trying to live normally always seemed an aberration. But try they did, while communities of them were denuded by collateral damage the homogenized military jargon for civilian deaths. We know that 56,000 Americans died, but how many Vietnamese perished? Was it two million or three million? To understand what their peace means now, try to imagine when their war began. Harry Truman was president, Attlee was prime minister, Coventry was still in ruins, more than half the present population of Britain had yet to be born. During many visits, I tried to keep track of one Vietnamese family, but pursuing the hurricane of tragedy that roared through their lives was impossible. Of four brothers and three sisters, none survived. The last to be killed was Kim, a teacher. I remember him listing the names, ages and details of his family's demise like an auctioneer. We feel trapped, he used to say, between the Americans whom we despise and the Northerners whom we fear. The real tragedy of Vietnam is that all our suffering will never earn us a choice. Can I just interrupt and ask, did the Americans know that the Viet Cong were established in tunnels under the ground? Did they know of the existence of this base? Thưa, tôi muốn hỏi là cái bọn Mỹ nó có biết là lực lượng của chúng ta tập trung ở tại địa đạo ở đây không? They know it. This was the largest and most secret Viet Cong base in South Vietnam, at Cu Chi, near Saigon. And this man was a leader of the Viet Cong. His military code name was Min No. 4. Beneath us lies a remarkable series of tunnels through which an army of guerrillas crawled from village to village, living their lives in darkness, emerging at night to resupply and to ambush. The Americans never found or destroyed the main tunnels, even though their own military command headquarters, with its air-conditioned generals, computers and Muzak, was barely 50 miles away. They scorched the earth with bombs and defoliant poisons, and Min No. 4 lived through it all, a subterranean creature for most of his adult life. Here, he says, a lone GI stumbled about directly above his tunnel. We had to first trip him up to get the right aim, he says. We tripped him with a rifle butt. Then we shot him. We killed them one by one. So if the Americans came in their helicopters, what would they do? They would simply disappear down there. 
I ask him? Yes, please. Dạ, khi mà uh, trực thăng của Mỹ đến đó, thì là uh, các uh, đồng chí uh, du Chúng tôi chui xuống và đầy nắp lại. Yeah. When the helicopters come, the, the, the guerrillas will uh, go under the tunnel and they close the trap. I asked Min number four how he regarded the Americans now. When I got out of the tunnels, he said, the first thing I did was get married and now I have a child. So I have mellowed and I feel sorry for the Americans. You see, they never understood. They never imagined losing. You know, they even regarded us as children. Now, we open. Yes. Two of us. Yes. man moved through the tunnel like a snake. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> this is how the Viet Cong lived and fought for almost a generation. The network of tunnels ran for 200 miles. Today, the tunnels are inhabited by unique insect mutations created by the tons of poisonous chemicals dumped on the earth above. This dirt chamber, now exposed, was a central operations room. From here was planned, by candle and torchlight, the beginning of the defeat of the greatest military power in history. Today, as Vietnam prepares to open up to the west, the survivors of the Viet Cong, like Min Number no. 4, are in training once again as tourist guides. This young woman's name is Tao. She is a tourist guide in a war crimes museum, a kind of Disneyland of carnage, which now displays examples of every devilish device that was used against them. With a typical Vietnamese sense of irony, the display is laid out in what was once the CIA headquarters in Saigon. This uh, seven-ton bomb is called the Daisy Cutter. Oh, the Daisy Cutter? Yes. And uh, they use it uh, first uh, in uh, Vietnam since uh, 1967. And uh, they use this bomb to uh, make landing crowd, landing crowd for helicopters. Yes. The cargo plane C-130 can only carry one bomb because of its weight. And did the daisy cutter break open into many pieces? Yes, this clear uh, uh, tree. Yes. Uh, and so the helicopter can land. It just and wiped everything out so the yes, helicopter came yes. down. Yes. And when it explodes, it causes a very high pressure. So it can, the pressure can kill both animals and um, people in a zone of uh, over of, uh, three kilometers and, uh, and, two meter, and 200 meters of diameter. Vietnam was as much a laboratory experiment as a war, a place to test an extraordinary range of weapons with the jargon name of anti-personnel, 
which means anti-people. There was Napalm B, a concoction which continues to burn through the lifetime of its victims. There were bombs that sucked oxygen from the air, killing every living thing. There was a bomb that sprayed thousands of small plastic needles that were almost impossible to detect, even under X-ray. At this display is a chart showing the tonnage of bombs dropped on Korea on the left, World War II in the middle, and on the right, Vietnam, the greatest aerial bombardment ever. At Christmas 1972, American B-52 bombers carried out the largest single aerial bombardment in history here in the streets of Hanoi. Few outsiders witnessed it, and you never saw it on television. At 10 o'clock on that boxing night, a B-52 flying at 30,000 feet laid a carpet of incendiary bombs down this street. The bomb aiming was brilliant. The bombs hit every third house, every third block of flats, and a kindergarten. Shortly after that, I came here, and one of the survivors told me, we sang as the bombs came down, all of us, very loud. Why? Because in Vietnam, we had to believe that singing was louder than bombs. After that, it was found that some 30,000 children in Hanoi alone had lost their hearing because of the bombing on that Christmas. Arriving in North Vietnam is like stumbling on the aftermath of some great and unrecorded disaster. Vietnam was the first television war, but only the war in the South was saturated by the media. This was a town called Dong Hoi, where layer upon layer of bombing destroyed even the foundations of houses, hospitals, schools, factories, pagodas and churches. Today it is like a snapshot of a small Hiroshima set in a moonscape of craters. You will not have heard about this town, and you will not have heard of a town called Ham Long, which was bombed more than Dresden, every day for four years, from five in the morning till two in the afternoon. Those who survived did so by developing their ingenuity and patience to the extreme human limits. One of their secret weapons, since Dien Bien Phu, the venerable bicycle, is now being pressed into the service of reconstruction. Each one is designed to carry half a ton of supplies for up to 500 miles. And when the American bombers had gone, the paddies would come alive with small groups of mostly women and children who swam pontoons into place to keep the convoys moving south, then dismantled them and hid them before sunrise. All life went underground. Whole factories, schools, hospital wards and operating theatres. The same ingenuity and determination exist today, but I suspect these will not be enough to rebuild their country, and unless Vietnam gets the technology she now craves, irrigation schemes such as this will be all for nothing. To the west is the Ho Chi Minh Trail, a road to victory, they called it. Though victory is a word not much heard in North Vietnam today, as its memory is chastened by an unexpectedly brutal normality. In the villages from here to the mountains, people are now living on the brink of famine. Rice is being rationed to just six pounds per person per month. That's less than even Bangladesh. The reason stems from two crop failures and the sudden grafting of the alien economies of the North and South. The Vietnamese reckon that unless 10 million people are moved from the cities back to the countryside, the normality of Vietnam will simply change from one of war to starvation. This is Route 1, running south from Hanoi to Saigon. 
that was known in wartime as the Street of No Joy. It was a nickname shared with equal good reason by the guerrillas who depended on its convoys and by the American pilots who blitzed it. And this river marks the 17th parallel, which divided North and South Vietnam. The line was arbitrary and was set by the Geneva Conference on Indochina in 1954, when the then US Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, the high priest of the Cold War, decreed that communism was to stop here and his client state in Saigon was to be preserved at all costs. For a decade, thousands of US Marines dug in in the demilitarized zone just south of here with orders not to go an inch forward. In 1967, I flew here and spent some time with them and the helicopter that brought me was blown up in the mud as it tried to take off again. Such were the appalling conditions of war, six months of mud, six months of dust. They're an extraordinary group, mostly volunteers, blacks escaping the ghetto, and poor whites weaned on John Wayne. Day and night, they were pounded with artillery, mortar, and rockets. They lay in their trenches, in their own blood and dirt, and with their frustrations. I should say that few soldiers have endured such conditions and have resisted so bravely for so long in the cause of nothing. A soldier came down from the Ambient with silence in his eye. He told of many a night when fire was the sky. Many more would have to die Many more would have to die This is Da Nang, a city of survivors, of people forced off their land by the war and into shanties and violence and a great deal of self-hatred. Da Nang was the biggest American base and the biggest whorehouse in all Vietnam. The American world and the world of the Vietnamese, the gooks, only touched at points of war and rape. The base was like a giant bubble in which martinis were served at happy hour and prime cut steaks were devoured beneath plastic chandeliers. Da Nang's economy was based on a network of pimps and prostitutes and beggars, all of them to satisfy the needs of the foreign soldiers. And when the foreign soldiers were tired from battle, they were given a game to play called Wham, which was short for winning hearts and minds. Just grab them by the balls, they'd say, and their hearts and minds will follow. I flew out from Da Nang with Sergeant Melvin Morell and his WAM unit. And when we arrived at the village of Toulon, just near here, Sergeant Morell opened up his WAM handbook at page 86, which read, give them the important little things of life and you'll give them the basic liberties. So Morell and his men handed out packets of Uncle Ben's processed miracle rice, chocolate bars, Superman comics, and 7,000 toothbrushes. That evening, there were several shots outside our camp and Morell and his men opened up with everything destroying most of the village and killing 10 people. And the next morning through the smoking ruins came his commanding officer, Colonel Richard E. Trueball. Well, Morell, said the Colonel, how's the pacification program going? Well, sir, said Morell, toothbrushes went down a dandy, but these gooks sure have strange ways of going to the bathroom. Never say die, Morell, said the Colonel. Tomorrow I'll send you in some electric flush lavatories. And he did. 
in green, pink, and yellow. I think it's important to recall stories like that when trying to understand what Vietnam's like now. The people here live under a strict post-war regime. Some of them oppose it and even yearn for the old days. But no longer are they gooks, fit only to be house trained, the objects of absurd lethal games like Wham. The violence and tension I once knew in the streets here are all but gone. And the little subtle ways of Vietnamese civilization are slowly coming back. Courtesies and spontaneous sensuality with people touching each other once again. And families going on outings. And the parks and museums full. And footballers training. And children playing. Important, normal, peaceful little things. None of them mentioned in the Wham handbook. Today, Vietnamese school children sing a melancholy song about fires still to be put out. The fires being Vietnam's post-war problems, which are almost too numerous to comprehend. For example, South Vietnam is a live minefield and will remain one for generations. This beach at Da Nang is one of the few places where people can walk in safety. Here in 1965, the first US Marines stormed ashore Hollywood style to be garlanded by schoolgirls in flowing white tunics who stood at the water's edge and sang the stars and stripes forever. Food is running out fast in the cities. These people have been brought to what is called a new economic zone, to clear and make something of fallow and ravaged land. Nothing in their lives has prepared them for this, and their implements are crude and constant reminders of the recent past. This girl, whose shoulder was crippled by a hand grenade, is drawing water with one of many buckets made from napalm shells. The land itself is a legacy of the war. All this used to be thick jungle. It was laid completely to waste by defoliants and poisons dropped from the air year after year in what the Americans called Operation Hades. 44% of Vietnam's forests were destroyed in this way. The chemicals used were banned in the United States long ago because it was found that they not only poisoned the earth for up to 50 years, but also caused deformed babies. Where there was once forest, there is now the searing heat of a wilderness in which are sown the seeds of human mutations. Even when, in 1969, it was found that Vietnamese mothers were producing deformed babies after drinking and eating here, the poisoning did not stop. Operation Hades was merely changed to the more friendly and more politically acceptable Operation Ranch Hand. You know, there are so many ironies in the history of Vietnam. On September the 2nd, 1945, right where this mausoleum was, they ran up the flag of the Republic. When the Viet Minh, led by Ho, had taken power in, in, in Hanoi. And who helped them take power? The Americans. Standing in the square was an American serving officer called Major Archimedes Patty saluting the flag of the new Vietnamese Republic. And on that day in September in 1945, Ho said, we're going to have a declaration of independence like that country that has helped us so much, the United States. And do you know, their declaration of independence in Vietnam says, all men are created equal. They are given certain unalienable rights, among them the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. And the words are culled straight from the US Declaration of Independence. We want 
nothing for ourselves, only that the people of South Vietnam be allowed to guide their own country in their own way. I wish it were possible to convince others with words of what we now find it necessary to say with guns and planes. Good morning, Vietnam. Welcome to the Don Buster. Let's have some fun. From Saigon, this is the American Forces Vietnam Network. Yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. Now it looks as though they're here to stay. Oh, I believe in yesterday. Suddenly, I'm not half the man I used to be. We shall pay any price. Bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. We believe that peace is at hand. It is inevitable that in a war of such complexity that there should be uh, occasional difficulties in reaching a final solution. I said something wrong now I long for yesterday. That we today have concluded an agreement to end the war and bring peace with honor in Vietnam. Let us be proud of the two and a half million young Americans who served in Vietnam, who served with honor and distinction. And, and finally, to all of you who are listening, the American people, your steadfastness in supporting our insistence on peace with honor has made peace with honor possible. I know that you would not have wanted that peace jeopardized. This is Ho Chi Minh City, though at heart it's still Saigon, and it's still in shock. Forlorn street photographers still seem to be waiting for the GIs and their bar girls to come back, and no doubt there's still no film in their cameras. The American tap has been turned off. The greatest consumer society in the world that produced nothing, except about $1,800 millionaires, is like an old whore with a hangover. All the bloodbath propaganda has been proved totally false. I remember one desperate broadcast that implied that even the Virgin Mary was about to leap on a helicopter, but there is no sign that she did. The churches are full, though many of the faithful are no doubt praying for the bad or good old days to come back. Most private businesses have closed. Many of the Chinese who control the black market have gone, panicked as much by Peking's sudden and hysterical interest in its money-grubbing compatriots as by their inevitable destitution. The Continental Palace Hotel, where Graham Greene wrote The Quiet American, maintains its seedy grace. The Vietnamese middle classes have simply been left to wither on the vine. They are sad people, for when their last possession is finally sold, and they go to the authorities to plead poverty, they are directed to the trucks that leave every morning for the countryside and a harsh new life. This is the center of Saigon. Here there used to be a probably the most horrible statue in the world. It was an old Saigon regime soldier, two of them, one pushing the other, and the, the American joke was that it was the American pushing the Vietnamese into war. It said a lot about the war, and said a lot about the regime, I suppose. It was made of quickset cement, which was sprayed onto a swaying frame, and had the effect of papier-mâché, it was hollow. And now they've put this up, 
fact, on the first day of the liberation, they blew it up. Quite right, too. It's horrible. I suppose my my first feeling, and I've, this is, I've only been in Saigon a, a few hours, is what on earth are these people thinking? I mean, in the old days, they wouldn't stare at us. They're so used to us. Kids would beg. Maybe they still do beg. I don't know. But the population has thinned out. But one must be pleased that the, the, I haven't yet seen crippled little kids who used to sell jasmine flowers and veterans of the Saigon army used to come at you like crabs across the, the pavement with a, a sawn off diet cola can. Hold it out. Please money, please money. The extraordinary thing is to watch the, the men from Hanoi, the northerners, who are like country boys. They're still obviously in awe at this Sin City. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. These boys, have, these men have come down from the north from a completely agricultural communist society into the most wicked city, if you like, in the east, and uh, the most capitalist society. I mean, they, they hadn't seen all these Hondas before. They hadn't seen bar girls. Uh, the difference between the two city, I, cities, I suppose, is, is the difference between, say, New York and Shrewsbury. And you can tell the Northerners they're tall, rather doe-eyed, the Saigonese, uh, the hustlers. Along this street where most of the bars are now closed, most of the, the tailors, uh, Indians tailors are all, uh, are all closed. A lot of the bar girls though are still around. I can see their little, uh, little faces popping out from, from some of these. They go back in quickly enough. I mean, they're so shocked to see uh, what they might construe to be an American coming down that they, they don't really know what to do. Uh, but they're here, and I believe that their services are still for sale, though on uh, a North Vietnamese soldier's salary, it'd be very difficult. These are bar girls who have not escaped re-education, although the main reason they are in this rehabilitation centre near Saigon is their drug addiction. This young woman, a former prostitute, is 25 years old. She tells of growing up in a half-lit world of bars, dope, and big American bodies, once her father came to visit her in Saigon. When he saw me, she said, filthy and with needle scars, he was shocked and he cried. Her father was a Viet Cong and had secretly come out of the jungle to see his family, as the VC sometimes did. She has not seen him since and believes he is dead. As for re-education, she said nervously, I am cured of the old ways. I have accepted Uncle Ho's wisdom. She also said, departing from the script, listen, mister, Nothing could be worse for me than what it was. Most of these young men were heroin addicts. They are street pushers, thieves, students, and soldiers of the old South Vietnamese army. They are withdrawn from their habit by constant exercising, oh. yoga, and acupuncture. For some, it can be a brutal method of cure because they are given no drugs to ease their pain and to wean away their addiction. There is perhaps little else the new authorities can do as there are more than half a million addicts amongst the flotsam of the war including those who took their first opium pipe under the French half a century ago.
These are the true faces of suffering of a society colonized, vandalized, and bombed. Resilience was always the basic strength of Vietnamese society, whatever its politics. This man, a former soldier, is typical of many who represent the total collapse of this resilience. He told me, sure I'm cured, but he is not cured at all. He's also terrified that he will say anything out of step with his re-education. He must surely wonder about his life. His last masters gave him drugs and ignominious defeat. His present masters give him press-ups and words that are meant to vacuum clean his mind. These are former soldiers of the Saigon Army at a remote re-education camp. And these were their generals. I know of an army doctor whose family has had no news of him for three years. And yet his son-in-law has been released from a camp and is working again as an architect. He said there was little brutality, but suicides were not uncommon. Here at another re-education camp, defeated soldiers heave a plough through the mud of a paddy. Most are the generation of war, streetwise, battlewise, helicopterwise, but few are peasants. Once they were members of the fourth largest army on earth. When our camera turned away, one young soldier glanced quickly at his guard, looked straight at me, and mouthed that universal four-letter word and rammed two fingers to the sky. Just how do you re-educate such bitterness? How do you explain to these former conscripted men who fought in the cause of America, whatever that was, that Americans are now being welcomed and courted in Hanoi? How do you explain that his new communist masters have offered unconditional diplomatic ties with America? How do you explain that the former hawkish American Defense Secretary, Robert McNamara, wants the World Bank, of which he is now head, to lend money to communist Vietnam because he is impressed with the movement of people to the new economic zones, people like these soldiers. Was it not Mr. McNamara who dreamt up an electrified fence around South Vietnam that would, in his words, sanitize the nation against the disease of communism? Explain all that, and you will explain the game in which these bitter young men were the pawns. Do you remember Operation Babylift, that squalid episode when hundreds of waifs, many of them not orphans, were bundled out of Saigon? Do you remember this horrific picture? 150 babies died when a so-called mercy plane crashed on takeoff. The children were taken from Vietnam for dubious charitable motives and to polish the peacemaking image of Richard Nixon's successor. <laughs> Those of you who recall the assault on your emotions caused by Operation Babylift will be pleased to learn that the thousands of street children, orphans and handicapped kids left behind are receiving a care that has a national priority in the new Vietnam. It is a care that covers equally the small nation fathered by Americans. The mixed children at this Saigon orphanage, the Young Flower School, are totally accepted as Vietnamese. They are taught self-reliance, they have their own vegetable garden, cow, fish pond and barber shop. These children are given a sensitive, unembellished story of their origins. They are told simply that their fathers were foreign soldiers who had to go home. There is no mention of war crimes or imperialist aggressors. And if their mother can be found, 
and she has an address in America, as sometimes happens, they are encouraged to write to their fathers. The compassion and total absence of rancor embodied in the official approach to bringing up these children of the former enemy is the other side to a regime that indulges its Stalinism in the intellectual barbarities of re-education. For me, it expresses a generosity of spirit that is especially Vietnamese. While I was at this orphanage, the children sang a song that ended with these words. The war is gone, planes come no more. Do not weep for those just born. The human being is evergreen. Tao, my guide at the War Crimes Museum, was imprisoned in the tiger cages on Khon Son Island. She describes what was done to her and how she felt on the day of peace. Uh, they put uh, in the tiger cage the prisoners they couldn't submit in other jail. So they put them there to repress them, especially. So when the prisoner, uh, the prisoner always uh, uh, object, uh, always uh, uh, protest to go into the tiger cage. So they beat them first. In the tiger cage with the roof, there is a passage on the ceiling. So from there, they can pour down quick light or dirty water in, in cold weather. In hot weather, they pour down quick light and the quick light uh, make the skin burn. And in the tiger cage, they give very little uh, rice to eat, very little water. And they give for each uh, meal um, small fish, dry fish, very bitter, that prisoner called quinine fish. So uh, because of the lack of very poor, very high lack of vitamin, the prisoner uh, vomit constantly. Yeah. So we, we uh, take the grass to eat um, when we can go outside to empty the, 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 the box, the excrement box. Or we catch uh, the mouse or the, the, the small animals to eat, see, to have which mean to survive. You ate the mice. Yeah. And, and we struggle. And I think that it is the, the, the main force to help us to survive. When I was released, I couldn't walk. I couldn't walk. I was paralyzed. So I was cured uh, in those months. But uh, at the time of the liberation, my legs are still very weak. But I've participated in the liberation. I've, um, planted the, 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 the flag, the revolutionary flag, first in my quarter. What were your feelings on the day the war ended? Oh, I don't know how to, how to say my feelings. I, 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 it seemed that I, uh, I fly and <laughs> I didn't walk. <laughs> and I don't know. Um, the happiness make tear pour down. <laughs> Outside my hotel here in Saigon, a loudspeaker tells people when to get up and what they should think. In the old days, the same loudspeaker used to issue similar directives, which were dutifully ignored. Words and images have changed. Coca-Cola has come down, Uncle Ho has gone up. The Vietnamese have been liberated from war, but have they been liberated from insidious, old-fashioned repression? Recently, a petition arrived in Hanoi from America, which read like a who's who of those who most vigorously opposed the war. It protested against the denial of human rights for many Vietnamese. People sent to re-education camps are not heard of again, including nationalists who were jailed and tortured under the old Saigon regime in their long struggle for democracy. And what has happened to the Viet Cong? 
the guerrillas of the south who fought so heroically. Only the flag of Hanoi flies here now, and northerners hold all the key posts. Re-education camps, loudspeakers, book burning, watchdogs in red armbands everywhere. But balance this against a civilized takeover after 30 years of bitterness, and new hospitals, and orphans being lovingly cared for, and an absence of tension, violence, and war. And as the war recedes in the memories of the first generation at peace, Vietnam will, I believe, liberalize as Yugoslavia has done. After all, the Northerners won, not as Oriental Prussians under the spell of an ideology, but as nationalists with an extraordinary sense of their nation's history. Those strategists who like to drop small nations into this or that camp will be confused by the Vietnamese, whose current, almost desperate efforts to make friends with America have nothing to do with ideology and everything to do with an historic fear of China and of becoming embroiled in the Cold War between China and Russia. It was typical of the Vietnamese that they should take arms from Moscow but leave the Russians in Hanoi to hear of their victory on the voice of America. You might like to consider the terrible irony in all of this. Why did the Americans sabotage the establishment of a united Vietnam under Ho Chi Minh 30 wasted years ago? To contain the spread of Chinese communism, of course. What all this surely means is that if America had left this country alone, Vietnam would have evolved quickly into what it is now attempting to become, an Asian Yugoslavia. It would have been a country of haunting beauty, without minefields, drug addicts, devastated towns, poisoned earth, and horizons of graves. It would have been a fiercely independent state on reasonable, self-interested terms with its region and with most of the world. That the American war merely delayed this process and in the meantime caused the death and maiming of several million people and the destruction of their land is the saddest truth of my time. I was told a story which says much about these indestructible people, the Vietnamese. There was a re-education lecture here in Saigon, and the subject was hatred of the Americans. When the lecture was over, a small old woman stood up and started talking furiously. Yes, she said, I hate the Americans. They're foul, odious, and the proof is that their war left us no choice but to accept the communists at which the audience broke out laughing and clapping. What can any regime do with independent minds like these? The Vietnamese have many battles yet to win. We withdrew from Vietnam. The communists would control Vietnam. Pretty soon, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, and all of Southeast Asia would be under the control of the communists and under the domination of the Chinese. Yeah. 
some people running along the dice. Roger. Good job. I saw you splatter one right in the back with a rocket. Roger got lucky again. It's time that we recognized ours was in truth a noble cause. Everybody get off the middle of this LZ. Throughout the years of negotiations, we have insisted on peace with honor. Let us be proud of the young Americans who served with honor and distinction. A retreat of the United States from Vietnam would be a communist victory of massive proportions and would lead to World War III. Twenty years ago this week, I reported the end of the Vietnam War from here, the American Embassy in Saigon, where the last American troops fled from this helicopter pad on the roof. The American invasion of Vietnam had marked the last stage of the longest war this century, a war in which the greatest tonnage of bombs in history was dropped, in which more than two million Vietnamese were killed and a bountiful land devastated. This film is not just about an anniversary, but will try to rescue something of Vietnam's past and present from Hollywood images that have pitied the invader while overshadowing one of the epic national struggles of the 20th century. Above all, it's about a remarkable people who have paid a high price for their victory over a superpower. Indeed, the terms of their long-awaited peace are still being negotiated. This is 1965. U.S. Marines land at China Beach near Da Nang in central Vietnam. One Marine who followed them was Lieutenant Robert Muller, who was decorated for bravery before being shot through the spine. We took him back to China Beach. Did you feel when you arrived here in Da Nang that you were fighting the good fight against communism? Absolutely. I chose Vietnam, and I chose infantry. And I absolutely believed that we were here to repel this massive communist invasion from the North on the freedom-loving people of the South. And uh, it didn't take long actually fighting the war over here to have that explode into the myth that it was, you know, confronting the reality of what was going on in this country. Do you remember when that first struck you? Yeah, when I arrived at the airport right up here in Da Nang and had all of these people in black pajamas running around the airport, and I said, wait a second, I thought people in black pajamas were supposed to be the Viet Cong and the enemy. What the hell are they doing all over the airport? I'm serious. Vietnam was a lie. It was a lie from the beginning, throughout the war, and even today, as they're trying to write it into the history books, it's a lie. You know, a lot of people that came over here, and there were three million U.S. servicemen here, you know, confronted the reality. Vietnam has a secret history that is full of irony. It was here in the center of Hanoi on September the 2nd, 1945, that the great nationalist Ho Chi Minh declared independence from the French. All men, he began, are created equal, endowed with the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Ho took those words straight from the American Declaration of Independence. And when he asked the crowd filling the square, do you hear me, comrades? His appeal was also directed at the United States. Indeed, he resisted accepting aid from both China and the Soviet Union while he sent secret messages to Washington, to which he received not a single reply. Instead, and incredibly, America cast Vietnam as part of a Chinese-led communist conspiracy and on the basis of this mockery of the truth began 30 years of war. This is Mrs. Tai T. Tin, aged 84, whose life exemplifies the suffering of her country in the 20th century. She lost five of her eight children. 
Her husband died resisting the French when Vietnam was a French colony. Her two eldest sons were killed fighting the French, and her youngest son was killed fighting the Americans. <laughs> This century, the Vietnamese have been invaded by the French, the Japanese, the British, the Americans, the Cambodians under Pol Pot, and the Chinese. They have seen them all off at huge cost. There are many like Mrs. Tin. Đây là ảnh của chú Hoài Lâm, người con lớn của tôi. Thế thì Lâm thì khi đó thì là là công binh phá bom thì chiến đấu ở, ở, ở tức là Tây Bắc, Cao Bắc Lạng trở về dự cái trận địa biên phủ. Thì đóng ở Sơn La còn nòi, thì chôn cất ngay ở cái Sơn La. Thế đây là Lương. Thế thì nó thương tôi quá, nó đi thì tiễn nó ra ga thì chỉ biết là nắm cái tay con thôi. Thế tôi thì cứ nước mắt chạy quanh nhưng mà nghĩ con đi chiến đấu mà khóc thì làm nhụt lòng của nó. Thế tôi cũng không khóc. Thì nó đi, nó đi từ Củ Chi thì chiến đấu thì là không có thư từ gì cả. Thế thì trong lúc vào Nam như thế là ở nhà thì mẹ phải cẩn thận, cảnh giác, máy bay ném bom thì mẹ phải cẩn ấy. Còn voici les toutes premières images rapportées de Hanoi. Quatre arrondissements étaient touchés par les bombes. Malgré les informations transmises par le correspondant permanent de l'agence France Presse à Hanoi, Washington ne reconnut les faits qu'après plusieurs démentis. In 1966, America began the longest campaign in the history of aerial bombardment, aimed at North Vietnam. The fact that civilians were targeted was reported by very few Western journalists, among them James Cameron and Harrison Salisbury. Salisbury, an American, was vilified as a traitor. The tonnage of bombs dropped was many times greater than Hiroshima. This is Hong Gai, a coal mining and fishing town on the Gulf of Tonkin. The bombing here was more concentrated than even Dresden. Day after day, week after week, American carrier-based planes came in low over one of the most beautiful landscapes in Asia. I was one of the few outsiders to see the results. At this Catholic church, mass had just finished when it was destroyed by a direct hit. Khoảng vào lúc 7 giờ 30 thì lúc đó có tiếng báo động và chúng tôi chỉ kịp nghe cái tiếng ào một cái và tiếng vít của tiếng bom và coi như là bom Mỹ nổ. Nhưng mà lúc bây giờ tôi vẫn chưa biết rằng thì là nhà thờ đã mất hay chưa nhưng chỉ biết là cái nóc nhà nhà tôi là bay ngói hết rồi và coi như các cái tường là sập hết rồi. When I came here in 1975, I found this letter pinned to a classroom wall in the rubble of the school. It read, My name is Nguyen Tian. I am 15 years old. When I heard the air raid siren and the explosions, I hurried to the shelters. When I came out, my sister was lying there. She had pins all over her. The street where this family lived was hit by a new kind of bomb that sprayed small darts about the size of a pin. The darts had entered Tian's sister and continued to move about in her body for several days, causing her an agonizing death. They were made from a synthetic material difficult to detect under X-ray. They've since been used in wars from the Middle East to the Falklands to the Gulf, having been successfully tested here. The end of the war came almost by surprise. When America finally turned off the life support machine that had kept the Saigon regime going, the South Vietnamese army collapsed under the burden of its own corruption and reticence. They never had their heart in it, and they left only boots and graves. The last day embodied all the black farce of the war itself. The American evacuation signal was the playing of Bing Crosby singing, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. 
the last American ambassador to preside over this fortress was Graham Martin, a reclusive man who had lost his own son in the war and believed that America could never be beaten. A great tree dominated the embassy grounds and would have to be cut down if the big helicopters, known as the Jolly Green Giants, were to start the evacuation. Martin had refused to cut it down, saying, once that tree falls, America's prestige will fall with it. But as the hours ticked by, his staff began to fell the tree and to burn everything of value. I was standing here in the embassy courtyard and through the smoke billowing out of the incinerator on the roof, I saw dollar bills fluttering down. Twenties, fifties, one hundreds. Most of them were charred, but some were as good as the day they were printed. The Vietnamese waiting to be evacuated couldn't believe their eyes. Former ministers, generals and torturers of the old American back regime scramble for their severance pay from the sky or sent their children to retrieve the notes. All five million dollars were hauled in sacks onto the roof to be burned, on whose orders no one could say. I can tell you just this, said one embassy official, every safe in this building has been emptied and locked again so as to fool the gooks when we've gone. It was 2.30 a.m. when Secretary of State Henry Kissinger phoned Ambassador Martin and ordered him to leave. He packed the stars and stripes in a carrier bag and walked to the roof. At 5.20 a.m., the last Marines locked these gates, leaving behind terrified Vietnamese still waiting to be evacuated. The Marines ran frantically to the roof, to the last helicopter. Three hours later, as the sun beat down on Saigon, tanks flying the colours of the National Liberation Front entered the centre of the city. Their jubilant crews showed no menace, nor fired a single shot. The war was over. With the Americans finally gone, Vietnam was made an international pariah. The United States mounted an embargo that covered both trade and humanitarian aid and used its influence to sabotage loans from the World Bank that would have prevented starvation. One of Margaret Thatcher's first acts in coming to power was to ban shipments of powdered milk to Vietnamese children. The Hanoi government had hoped to end their dependence on the Soviet Union, but the blockade gave them nowhere else to turn. Such were the spoils of victory. For several years, the boat people, those who fled the austerity and repression of the post-war years, occupied the headlines. But now the return of tens of thousands of boat people has gone almost unnoticed. Under a program sponsored by the European community, an historic act of reconciliation has taken place. I suppose the impression people would get from the headlines of all those years about the boat people that uh, if they went back they might be victimised. Have you uh, had any evidence of that at all? None whatsoever, I I'm very pleased to say. And I've travelled very extensively throughout indeed all 21 provinces where our mm. programme operated from which something like 98% of the boat people emanated. And I've met thousands of returnees in all sorts of situations and I've come across not one instance of that happening. The Vietnamese generally are a very kindly people and I think people went out of their way here to ensure that those who came back didn't lose face as a result of doing so. Mấy năm bên đó thì mình có một cái cảm tưởng nó có cái cái mặc cảm tức là bị xa rời tổ quốc rồi thiếu thốn tình cảm rồi hơn nữa là cũng sẽ có những cái mà cũng có thể là tự mình nghĩ ra thôi đấy tức là cái mặc cảm nó 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 nó, nó có một cái gì đó mà mình cảm thấy rằng là gần như là sợ đấy. nhưng mà về thì nó lại khác hẳn như thế đấy cho nên là điều cũng đáng phấn khởi như vậy. In the late 1980s, the Vietnamese government declared a policy they called Doi Moi or Our Way. The aim was to break out of the economic siege. 
the so-called free market was embraced, foreigners were welcomed, and the embargo began to crumble. At the same time, personal freedom was encouraged, and people began to speak and criticize openly. As a friend of mine put it, color returned to our lives. But behind the move towards greater personal liberty were dramatic changes in the economy. These were based on the belief or the delusion that the rapid growth of a new consumer class could bring prosperity to all. Today, Vietnam has been declared an open marketplace and its people a cheap labor pool, with wages for skilled work as low as 20 pounds a month. As one American banker put it, the circus is back in town. In other words, a carve-up is taking place. America effectively runs the currency. Japan dominates the money lending, Singapore the property market, and Taiwan and Korea the sweatshops. The French and Australians are doing nicely too, with the British not far behind. And as the roads fill up and the air pollutes, the Vietnamese sink deep into debt to those who once profited from their suffering. I think life has been much easier and more pleasant because there's a lot more freedom. And uh, economically speaking, everybody's life has mm. been improved. And for me personally, uh, since, since then, I've been much more able to do my professional work. Before 75, though, you were neither with the old regime nor with the, 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 communists. the communists. No, but uh, I was a nationalist. Mm. I was for peace mm. and I was for true national independence. Right. Now, it seems to me that capitalism has arrived almost with a bang. What are the dangers? Many. <laughs> Can you of tell me? Of losing our soul. <laughs> of losing uh, what we have gained with so much uh, sacrifice, meaning losing this uh, ideology of uh, justice, you know, uh, of equality and so on. Vietnam represents to you a hybrid model, a model in which we have combined the best of both worlds to build our country here. Short of a better term, I used to call it market socialism. Isn't that a contradiction in terms? It's not a contradiction. It is a harmonious blending of the best of the two worlds to build Vietnam. Uh, the glamorous aspect of the Western uh, culture, of the bad side, of the worst side of Western culture, uh, seem to be more attractive, like materialism, consumerism, all that is now very, very attractive to the people to whom all this is new. When, when you open the doors for, for, for new winds to come in, dust would come in with it. We try to keep the dust out. That's an old Vietnamese saying. That's right. Mm -hmm. You see, an American investor told me the other day, he said, look, forget about this being a socialist country. Give it time, it'll be another capitalist country. Let's, let's hope so. Foreigners discovering Vietnam have little contact with the countryside where 90% of the people live and where for all the hardship there was once equality. The new free market policies are changing all that. Some of the first reforms were welcomed, but under a law drafted by the World Bank, the old system of rich landowners and tenant farmers is coming back. The system that Ho Chi Minh fought against and in doing so won the support of the majority. At this village in the south, they used to share everything. Now cooperatives are a thing of the past, and a middleman has moved in, paying this woman and her 12-year-old daughter a dollar a day between them to make beach mats for export. They work from 5 in the morning till 5 at night, 
And as education is no longer free, the girl has to work to pay for her lessons. It is the people, said Ho Chi Minh, who must have priority. His name may soon become an embarrassment for those in power claiming his legacy. The secret history of Vietnam was also the chemical war, the spraying of a deadly poison called dioxin. Its aim was to destroy the forests where the Viet Cong were, and it was confined to South Vietnam, which America had come to save. The spraying was called Operation Hades and was hardly reported at the time. And when it was, it was changed to the friendlier Operation Ranch Hand, and the spraying continued. Dioxin is a thousand times more powerful than thalidomide. I saw many forests destroyed, die. Only the dead tree, nothing, no animals, no birds. About two million hectares of the tropical forests of our country completely destroyed by herbicide. These American soldiers are hosing down vegetation with that poisonous herbicide. Half of Vietnam's mangrove forests were destroyed in this way. In 1970, the U.S. Senate was told, the United States has dumped on South Vietnam a quantity of toxic chemical amounting to six pounds for every man, woman, and child. These men are planting trees in one of the world's most remarkable regreening campaigns. Every school child in Vietnam plants at least one tree a year. In this way, millions of hectares of forest have been reclaimed, with little outside help and few resources. It is one of Vietnam's greatest post-war achievements. And this is the result. The earth has come alive again. The human cost of the chemical war is all too evident. Deformed children are more likely to be conceived in Vietnam than almost anywhere in the world. In 1994, the link between the herbicide known as Agent Orange and cancer was confirmed by the Australian government. American and Australian veterans have now been compensated for what Agent Orange did to them. The Vietnamese have received nothing. Hospitals like this one have appealed for the most basic equipment and have been ignored. Last year, how many malformed babies were born in this hospital? Uh, last year we uh, have um, uh, 266 mm. uh, cases of uh, malformation. 266? Yeah. yeah, in the hospital. Mm. And you've been getting that kind of figure over the years, haven't you? I think uh, it's the not uh, higher, but it's the same. About the same, uh, the same since, I think, about the mid the end of the 1960s, is that correct? It started to go up. Yes, yes, it started to go up. Yeah. In 1978, President Jimmy Carter rejected an appeal for aid for Vietnam. He said, the damage was mutual. We owe them nothing. This is a copy of a top secret letter drafted by American Secretary of State Henry Kissinger and signed by President Nixon on February the 1st, 1973. It was part of a deal negotiated by Kissinger with Hanoi in this building while the war was still going on. In exchange for a ceasefire, during which Nixon was to announce he'd achieved a great breakthrough, the Vietnamese were promised more than three billion dollars. In effect, reparations for the American invasion and the devastation of their country. Not a penny of this was ever paid. Instead, the American trade embargo was only lifted by President Clinton last year, and then only after the Vietnamese were compelled to pay $140 million, the sum of war debts incurred by the American client regime in Saigon, which they defeated 20 years ago.
20 years ago, Hanoi was a Trappist monk and Saigon was a whore with a hangover. With the new invasion, the north is being changed beyond recognition. Soon only foreigners will be able to afford the elite living on Hanoi's beautiful West Lake. The first golf clubs and exclusive resorts have opened, with the Vietnamese as caddies. The Hanoi Club, now under construction, offers membership fees ranging from $6,500 to $15,000. Cash, check or visa. But hurry, membership is strictly limited. What's the idea of the club? Because it's, it seems to be an extraordinary uh, aberration in a luxury place in Hanoi, and Hanoi is anything but a luxury city. Well, you see, my main line is not clubs. Um, it's building office buildings and retail centres and apartment blocks and stuff like that. Mm. And in order to make those prosper, you've got to be confident that there'll be a decent expatriate population. And one of the first things expatriates look for is um, lifestyle, environment, uh, sport, recreation. And there was absolutely nothing here. So uh, with my contacts, we found this beautiful site. And uh, the idea grew from there. Your membership rates uh, look uh, pretty high. Modest, modest, sir, modest. I mean, well, if I, you mean look... I couldn't afford six and a half thousand dollars for a club, but uh, I mean, who are the people that Corporations. Are... Vietnamese? No. Australians, Brits, Canadians, Yanks, the whole lot. Yeah. But um, how many Vietnamese members were there? So far, four. Um, but again, it's a lot of money in Vietnam. There's a lot of new Vietnamese money. And in time, we will see them as members too. Yeah. And I make no apologies for the fact that it's exclusive because these things will only work if they're exclusive. Mm. I mean, are they the government? Are they going to be ripped off, do you think? Yeah, sure. They already have been. Brokers putting deals together, knocking down buildings and then disappearing because they couldn't find the cash, because banks don't lend, you know, all the usual mad hatter stuff that happens mm. at the beginning of something like this. It's part of the education program of, of converting into this wonderful world of capitalism we now have. We have an SCCI license. Uh, to build a 15-story office tower, okay? And that office tower will have, hopefully, two mini theaters uh, for movie theaters and could be used for conference centers. Then we figured about 11 stories for office space. I would love to have on the 12th story a, in a, a health club with an indoor tr running track on it overlooking the West Lake here. And then the roof have a rooftop restaurant and bar. Is, is this mainly for expatriate companies? Uh... I would assume they're the ones that are going to be able to afford that. I mean, it's not going to be, uh, you know, it's not going to be uh, cheap rent or anything. Do, do, you, uh, do you see it at least as ironic that here you are, um, uh, a good, uh, full-blooded capitalist organization uh, dealing and going to make undoubtedly a good buck in a sort of joint venture effectively with a communist government? Do you ponder, you reflected on that? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah well, no, let, let's put it this way, John. We haven't made any money yet. You know, you, you, well, see, in you, Vietnam, you, Vietnam, what a lot of people don't understand is that you're coming in here with the money also, okay? Mm -hmm. And you have to spend the time and the effort mm -hmm. and, the, yeah. and the money to get... But in the end, I mean... You, you, well, you, I certainly hope you, so. You're not here for philanthropic reasons. I mean, you're... I hope you're, not, no. no. Hmm. I mean, if it doesn't work out, I can always work in the rice paddies, I guess, sure, you know. Sure, I, yeah. I can make a couple of bucks there, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think there's a, I suppose, a danger that all those foreigners that this country has been repelling this century, French, Japanese, Americans, British, um, might uh, by other means end up uh, achieving what they're unable to achieve through war? I mean, you're all back. Yeah, we're all back. You're all right. back yeah. Um, yeah. peacefully. Uh, mm. Is that, is that possible, do you think? I, I, I guess the way you put it, it, it has, a good, uh, has a good sound to it. A good, yeah, good meaning, yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, that's a good possibility, isn't it? Yeah, never thought of it that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At the Paris Peace Conference in 1973, the United States agreed to clean up its unexploded bombs and landmines in Vietnam. Nothing was done. If the Americans bomb people in South Vietnam in order to save them from communism, 
the largely unreported bombing of the communist north was for less altruistic reasons. When I came here to North Vietnam in 1975, I felt like somebody who'd stumbled on some great unrecorded disaster. I found a moonscape from which incessant bombing had obliterated all visible signs of life. Houses, factories, schools, pagodas, churches and hospitals. This was the Back Mai Hospital in Hanoi, the morning after President Nixon's Christmas bombing in 1972. Doctors, nurses and patients were killed and injured. One of the survivors was Professor Zhang. I first came here in 1972. So you came here just before the bombing? Yes. Uh, first, uh, I uh, work in the in, in intensive care unit. Right. I remember. Huh? Professor Zhang sheltered with his patients under these stairs. This frail and noble man is typical of those who built a unique national health service that was so successful the child mortality was cut to a rate comparable with rich countries and common disease was greatly reduced. Today much of the health service has been privatized. The better off are meant to pay for the poor, but the system is often pay or die. Vietnam, admits the World Bank, now has a higher proportion of underweight and stunted children than in any country in Southeast Asia except Bangladesh. Once again, deaths from malaria are common and patients are often two to a bed. Doctors are paid as little as eight pounds a month. Just to raise cash, the Ministry of Health runs ballroom dancing on Friday nights. Before, huh? mm. everything is free. The government pay yeah. everything for the patients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in the new system, insurance pay for patients who has in, huh? Uh, insurance and other patients, they have to pay themselves. Mm -hmm. But uh, among these, these poor patients, uh, when there is some difficulties, the director of the hospital sometimes pay for it. I see. In the countryside, it was the cooperative that paid for the local health clinic where women could have their babies in relative safety. It also paid for the village school. But now the cooperatives have gone, so too is another of Vietnam's proudest achievements. Universal education that produced a literacy rate of 90%, one of the highest in the world. Today, education is no longer free. Three quarters of a million children have been pushed out of the system, which has been tailored to the needs of the new labor market. In January, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Kenneth Clark, came to Hanoi with a group of British businessmen. There was the usual anodyne excitement about mutual benefit for the two countries. But this guide to British investors, produced by the Department of Trade and Industry in London, is rather more frank. Vietnam, it makes clear, is a gold mine. And why? Because people here are so cheap, the wages so low. The Vietnamese, it says, can provide a new industrial home for ailing British products. Moreover, UK firms can rejuvenate tired old products here by slashing costs. Take the long view, advises the British government. Use Vietnam's weaknesses. Vietnam's open door invites you to take advantage of its low standard of living and low wages. Reading that, I have to say that that sounds more like exploitation than investment. It sounds like it exploitation because it's put that way mm. because you can provide inexpensive labor I don't call that cheap labor I call it inexpensive labor then your cost of production will be competitive on the international market we are now offering cheap labor <laughs> uh, because of lack of experience because sometimes vested interest and maybe sometime out of necessity. See, in, in Saigon, from what I can understand, a lot of these new foreign joint venture factories are employing young women 
15 to 21. 25, yes. Cheap labor, mm -hmm. classic situation of cheap labor to be found all over Except. the third world. Except. That seems to me almost tragic. Yes. Uh, uh, it's also tragic for me. <laughs> yes. These ancient looms are reminiscent of machines used in the cotton towns of Lancashire 70 years ago. The young women working them get a basic rate of £12 a month and work up to 12 hours a day. If they fall behind a minimum target, they are sacked. The air is foul, the noise incessant, and the only protection from injury is a hair curler. The factory manager, who's from Taiwan, cheerfully admitted that there were no safety precautions. We have a medical centre for accidents, he said. The law says there should be a union. We haven't got one yet, he said. This is the brave new world of what they call an EPZ, which stands for Export Processing Zone. This one near Saigon is run by a company from Taiwan and will accommodate 100,000 workers employed by foreign companies. It will be, in effect, a city-state with dormitories for female workers, a stock exchange, its own customs, and all the profits will be shipped out of Vietnam. In the new Vietnam, the army has also turned itself into a business and runs the scene of one of its triumphs as a kind of theme park. Here girls dress up as Viet Cong, guiding tourists through the bomb craters and requesting them not to step on the new grass. This is Ku Chi near Saigon, where the Viet Cong built a system of tunnels that helped them win the war. The original tunnels were half this size and have been widened to accommodate large tourists. During the war, Vietnamese soldiers crawled through insects and snakes and with bombs falling overhead. More than 200,000 are still listed as missing in action. For a dollar a shot, tourists can even play their own war games. There's a choice of an American gun or a Viet Cong gun. And if you hit a bullseye, you win a genuine black and white Viet Cong scarf. And here's another happy winner. Most tourist buses don't come here because the road is too bumpy. This is My Lai, where more than 200 people were massacred by American troops on March the 16th, 1968. Mrs. Ha Ti Kui is 70 years old. Her three children were murdered in a ditch as she lay wounded beneath their bodies. <laughs> cái xuống đó cái cô này bén ở đằng chỗ đây mà bén miết rồi đó bà 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 con rồi cháu rồi mẹ rồi cha chết bả người y xì cứ thấy sợ quá không biết làm sao không biết nghĩ sao ấy cháy trận này là cháy chứ không có sống mà hiện nó bê lục lọt đây nữa đây có một đường thôi đây đi tới đây cái là con bén xuống đó rồi ở đảng rồi cứ nghĩ cái đài đi xuống đài cái là con bán hiện người nào bị thương mà ngát cái đầu là nó bán thôi nó không có kể gì nó bán như vậy mới tới cái trận mà for the crime at Milai one junior American officer went to jail for four and a half months Vietnam was said to be the first media war in which there was saturation coverage 
But this was always a misleading impression. At the time of the massacre here at My Lai, there were more than 600 correspondents in Saigon, but only a handful of them ever left the city. And the story of the massacre was suppressed in the United States for more than a year until it was finally published and represented as both an aberration and an American tragedy, a theme that Hollywood was later to take up. Indeed, the walls of the offices of foreign news organizations in Saigon were often papered with photographs like these, hundreds of photographs that were never sent and never published. For the truth is that the nature of the war itself was atrocious, a story that Hollywood is still to tell. The history of the war has been rewritten by Hollywood with a series of films that have blended Rambo and self-pity, a potent combination. The message has been sometimes crude and sometimes subtle, but always the same. America made mistakes, but it was really the fault of the Vietnamese for defending their country. In other words, the crusade was flawed, but it was a noble one, just as the Hollywood actor Ronald Reagan said it was. I think the drip, drip, drip of what may be now, 10, ten films, the selectivity of, of the image of the war, or the images of the war, the, yeah. the subjectivity, don't forget those films, they've almost all been subjective movies, mm. uh, has, has created a, an image which is going to take generations and generations to eradicate. But it's quite a stark image in some respects, isn't it? I don't think, John, that it's an image which allows any sense of the Vietnamese through. Mm. I mean, the Vietnamese are figures in the landscape. I still think those movies are very offending. Those movies basically is not to let people know what the Vietnamese people are about. They just want to see what the American mm. is about, or mm. the American viewpoint of the Vietnamese is about. It's not the truth. It's, come on, it's not. I mean, you got to be crazy to believe that. And I truly hate them with a passion. <laughs> Yet these purging fables of Hollywood have become, by default, our popular history, deceiving a generation. I've seen Platoon, Missing in Action, Born on the Fourth of July, mm -hmm. Hamburger Hill and Good Morning Vietnam. Yeah. None of these films have been about the Vietnamese, have they? No, they haven't. I mean, I suppose it's a bias. They're trying to sort of say that it's all evil, you know, it's all the, the Vietnamese mm -hmm. fault. You know, they're the ones who sort of started it. Mm -hmm. They're the ones... I mean, they showed... Um, I says the Vietnamese in a very bad light as well because of all the torture um, mm. and the fact that, you know, the Vietnamese, when they were captured, they tried to sort of mm. um, commit suicide rather than actually be tortured or held as prisoner, mm. whereas, you know, mm. our men were put in. I remember um, reading something, actually, on men who were tortured. They were laid in these um, bamboo cages. Those cages and the Russian roulette scene and Deer Hunter have now almost become fact. Uh, whereas Chimino himself had finally admitted none of it happened and none of us who were there could ever remember anything like that happening. No one ever set out, I don't think, to create a great untruth. But because of the lack of balance and because of the, dr the demands and the, and the constraints of the dramatic medium, we're, we're buggered. But isn't it about Hollywood as well? Not just the feature film as such. I don't th think it's about Hollywood. I think in that sense it's about America. I think America is a strange complex country, fascinating mm -hmm. country, uh, where, which in a childlike way is only able to deal with certain truths. This is a nation that can't deal with complexity. We like our truths, but we like them simple, and if necessary, we'll have them distorted. You've had the culture, and then you've had, you know, really a lot of influence out of the office of the president, particularly under Reagan, you know, exploiting um, all of these negative issues, like the missing in action, prisoner of war issue, to portray the Vietnamese as vile, rotten, evil people holding out boys in bamboo cages. You know, those are emotional buttons in America that have been pushed very successfully. You've had Hollywood come in and, and, and exploit that with movies like Rambo, Uncommon Valor, MIA, and on and on and on and on. And you have now in America, when you mention Vietnam, something that people think of in, in mythical terms. You know, Vietnam is a war. You know, it's, it's, it's a set of emotions. It's not a country of 72 million people. You know, it doesn't connect. The reality of what, you know, we know to be here, Vietnam, isn't in any way at all connected to America. It's just not.
Vietnam's greatest resource is not money, nor factories, nor tourism, but people. And as most people come from the countryside, it's clear that true prosperity will come not from turning this into an industrial sweatshop, but from a modern agricultural-based economy that sustains the nation and the environment. This way, Vietnam could be a model for developing countries. This is not idealistic. All over Asia, the real cost of the so-called tiger economies is there to see, in polluted cities and rivers, and stolen forests, in people racing to make more and more goods for export, and to pay more and more interest on debt. When the financial pages say approvingly that Vietnam is now exporting rice, what they don't say is that people here are going hungry. And when Vietnam's leaders say the World Bank knows best, what they don't say is that their history makes clear that the sources of discontent that challenged injustice in the past can return. Perhaps that's why beggars and other very poor people are being swept off the streets of Saigon and sent to detention centers, and why anti-government Buddhist leaders, reminiscent of those who helped topple the old regimes, are prisoners of conscience. It is ironic that the only censorship we encountered in making this film was official concern that my interviews with the survivors of the American massacre at My Lai might offend the United States and hold back American investment. Certainly, to Americans coming here, what is striking is that ordinary people bear them no grudge. Many say they cannot understand this generosity, just as many could not understand how such a people could resist America's power. You know, uh, I feel that Americans are obsessed with their own failure at their own past. And they have not recovered from this failure. Why? We are looking ahead, we're working for the future. And we forget. We really forget about this period. And we have so many other things to think of. <laughs> why, why are the Vietnamese able to forget and America isn't? Because we didn't lose. We won. We won. <laughs> we lost, materially speaking, but spiritually we have won. And we're losing a little bit now, but we will win again. <laughs> The other day, the Americans were given back this embassy building in Saigon. They gave little in return. We have smashed this country to bits, wrote Telford Taylor, the chief American prosecutor at the Nuremberg trials, and we will not even take the trouble to clean up the blood and rubble. He was referring not to Germany, but to Vietnam. In order to rebuild their country, the Vietnamese have been finally granted a place in the new world order but only on certain conditions. They must first create a society based on exploited labor and divisions of rich and poor. A society in which achievements in health and education will not be valued as before. And freedom will be sold as a commodity with a bottom line. In other words, the kind of foreign imposed society they sacrifice so much to get rid of. Certainly, if Vietnam does not resolve these issues to the benefit of all its people, it will be one of the great tragedies of modern history. So perhaps the most difficult battle of all has only just begun. And this being Vietnam, it is far from lost.